Hey, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this evening's um, events with the British Association of Holocaust Studies, uh, where we will discuss Holocaust consciousness in Britain uh, as a response to the Claims Conference survey. We're very excited to be joined tonight by Dr. Andy Pierce, who is an Associate Professor in Holocaust and History Education at University College London. Andy has collaborated on projects with the Imperial War Museum in London, the UK delegation to the International Task Force, and authored the Vena Libraries Institute, the, the Vena Library Institute of Contemporary History's traveling exhibition, Never Again Thinking About the Holocaust. He is author of, he's also the author of a monograph, Holocaust Consciousness in Contemporary Britain, and most recently co-authored Welford alongside Tim Lawson, the Palgrave Handbook of Britain and the Holocaust, which I'm sure many of us have, um, have been avidly reading since it came out uh, earlier this year. Um, and it's wonderful to have you here. Um, and we're really much looking forward to, to the discussion. So I know Charlie and I have lots of very exciting questions. Um, but just before we launch into those, I will hand over to Charlie to give a brief overview of the, the claims conference survey, which we're sort of talking in response to today. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Um, so I thought I'd just give a brief um, rundown of some of the main findings that the Claims Conference Survey found, just in case anyone hasn't seen uh, anything about it, but I'm sure you have. Um, so the Claims Conference Survey uh, found several findings that are problematic, that are uh, that need action that are taken upon them. So it found that 52% of UK respondents did not know that 6 million Jews were killed during the Holocaust, and nearly one quarter believed that less than 2 million had been, had been killed. 32% were unable to name a, a single one of either the camps or the ghettos that, that were established during the period. 56%, so over half, believed that something like the Holocaust could happen again. And again, a similar number also believed that fewer people seem to care about the Holocaust today than they used to. And uh, most pertinent for Britain, I suppose, um, is that 76% had not heard of the kinder transport, uh, which we put as the image uh, for the advert uh, for this event. So that those are some of the main findings in terms of Holocaust the consciousness that Britain currently has and that was what the claims conference survey found. Uh, so as Lana said uh, the plan is is that we will go through uh, our questions that we have. If you have any questions throughout if you can post them in the chat and then myself and the Barnabas will ask them uh, to uh, Dr Pierce at uh, the end. Uh, so without like, further ado, I believe we'll go run into questions, if that's okay, Andy. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks very much for having me and uh, look forward to uh, talking things through this evening with you. Fantastic. Um, so just maybe to kick us off, Andy, I wanted to ask, what was your reaction when you saw the results um, of the, the claims conference survey? Well, um, I, I suppose one thing which is important to um, say from the outset is that uh, there was some positive news from this survey. Um, obviously, there was a, a high percentage of respondents who indicated that they felt uh, or, or said that they uh, had a level of awareness about the Holocaust. Um, there was a high percentage, a very high percentage of people who indicated a positive attitude towards learning about this history and that recognised the importance of, of, of Holocaust education. So broadly speaking, those are all very welcome things to hear, aren't they? Um, uh, nevertheless, of course, the, the sort of headlines that you've just been reading out, Charlie, are, are arresting uh, and clearly they're, they're very concerning. Um, I suppose my reaction was obviously coloured by um, my experience in terms of my professional experience, but also my academic interest in, in, this, in this spirit. And um, in that sense, I think I didn't find the results that revelatory. Um, instead, for me, they kind of fell into a pattern which we've started to see over the last 10 years or so, which has been built up um, through empirical research that we've been conducting, for instance, at UCL, 
um, but also in the longer term, from the last 10 to 20 years, um, similar kind of surveys that have been conducted by HMDT. Um, in 2018, there was the CNN um, Conres poll, which um, was looking at anti-Semitism in Europe, but as part of that, touched on issues of knowledge and, and the Holocaust. And I think cumulatively, if we, if we put that um, those research projects and those surveys um, together, um, I think what we find is, on the one hand, we've got a greater insight into the nature, the substance of, of, of Holocaust consciousness in, in Britain than ever before. Um, and with that, we find that the picture we've presented with is, is quite stark and is quite concerning. Um, and I think it's stark and concerning, not least because it raises elemental questions about how we've got here, how have we got to this, this state, um, this position, uh, why are these issues seemingly so persistent over the years? Uh, and also, what are we actually going to do about it? So, um, yes, I absolutely agree that the, the headlines of the, of the survey were, were, were arresting. But uh, for me, they fit into that wider context of, of the last uh, 10 years in particular, but, but longer than that, perhaps the last 15 to 20. Thank you. I suppose also to feed on from what you just said, and you mentioned the work that UCL had done, the empirical research that had been going on. I suppose one of those was a uh, survey where you, where, you, where you collected evidence from uh, secondary schools. Um, and within this, like you asked like, thousands of, of students across the country on their views, their knowledge of the, of the Holocaust, and you get with the numerous findings, some of which we can see in the claims conference survey still. Uh, so uh, there were gaps in education, but as you say, there were also uh, general understanding of the local still, but not the specific for necessarily. Uh, and I think there's a line in the report from UCL uh, from 2016, was it? Yes, that's right. Yep. Uh, and you say that despite the Holocaust being a staple in the curriculum for almost 25 years, student knowledge and conceptual understanding is often limited and based off of inaccuracies, inaccuracies and misconceptions. So as I said, although it's a staple in the curriculum, are we doing enough for that? So I suppose since that study, well, now like five years ago, has anything changed? Is it is it better in terms of schools? Uh, and what can we take from these differences or the similarities between the two the surveys? Sure, okay, well, uh, I mean, I suppose, I suppose one thing to say is that um, the 2016 study and the, um, and the claims conference survey are in one sense substantively different. So the 2016 survey was looking at um, uh, uh, young people who are in formal education, their age 11 to 18. Um, their formal education setting is one where um, at least in theory, the Holocaust should be taught to them uh, as part of their as part of their formal education. Um, the claims conference survey obviously is looking at adults who are aged eighteen or over, um, and they're going up, you know, into the into seventy year olds and, and beyond. So, so there is that very substantive difference between the two sets of results, um, and and, uh, and and the, the demographics behind them. And I think that's really important to bear in mind. But um, it's also important, I think, to think about the, the differences between those two pieces of research um, in terms of the methodological approach, um, in terms of the scale and the scope. Um, I mean, the 2016 study, you, you've alluded to how, how large it was. I mean, we, we had over a million items of data, either from quantitative uh, instruments or from the qualitative research that we conducted as well. So it was, it was vast, it was enormous. Um, and we were also interested in some ways in some different things to the, to the claims conference survey. So there, there are some kind of significant differences between the two. Um, that notwithstanding, I, I think there are um, absolutely there's ground for us to, to draw some um, commonalities between them and to speak of some continuities despite that passage of five years. Um, one of them, the, I suppose the good news story again, is that um, there's a common commitment um, to um, teaching about the Holocaust, the belief that this is important. 2016, we heard students saying that they thought it was really important. 2020, 2021, we're hearing from 18 year olds plus that they think it's important. So clearly that's, that's a, a welcome news. Um, I think broadly speaking, there's also commonalities in terms of the, 
gaps and the uh, uh, issues related to historical knowledge and understanding between the 2016 study and, of the students and, and the 21 study of, of 18 year old plus. And I think those commonalities are, are, worth us, are worth us thinking about. And actually, when you actually kind of pinpoint what those knowledge gaps are and those misconceptions are and those misunderstandings are, then we get a better picture, a better insight into the fundamental issues that are underlying our kind of Holocaust culture and, and consciousness that comes from it. So by way of example, in 2016, the, the research found that students had a really limited conception of the, the places and the spaces of the Holocaust, both with regards to specific places as in ghettos or camps, but also just more broadly in terms of their geographical understanding of, of, of the, the scale and the scope of, of, of the events. Uh, likewise, that very much came through with the, the claims conference survey. Uh, again, we're seeing there a sort of telescopic focus on or an assumption. Seemingly, I think it was 76% or something like that said that the Holocaust happened in Germany in, in the 21 claims conference survey. Uh, that very much mirrors the, the assumption that a lot of students were, were telling us in 2016 that this was something which happened in Germany and, and, and maybe a little bit in Poland as well. So there's commonalities in terms of misconceptions and misunderstandings of the spaces and the geographies of the Holocaust, uh, which of course is very out of step with, with the trajectories of, of scholarship at the moment. So I think there's, there's one thing to, 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 to highlight there. Also in terms of commonalities, I think there's a, a lot to be said about the issues around knowledge and understanding of Britain, Britain's connection to the Holocaust. When did it know what, how did it respond? Um, there are some slight differences if you actually kind of really kind of hone in on the finer details of, of, of the percentages between the two studies. Um, so by way of example, you, you see that um, some of the adults uh, seemingly have a better understanding that um, Britain promised to punish the killers after the war. Well, that's the most kind of appropriate result in the, in the, the questionnaire. Um, whereas the number of students was, was half uh, that of the adults in that particular area. So there are some slight differences, but broadly speaking, we're, we're, we're seeing both with 2016 and 2021, a, a, a depiction of Britain as um, detached from these events, um, also one which uh, Britain kind of is cast or, or understood to be um, a saviour, a rescuer, um, either doesn't know anything about it or, or goes to the other extreme and actually, you know, champions taking on uh, the, the, the might of Nazi Germany in, in, in defence of the Jews. And none of this obviously bears reality with the historical record. So there's another set of commonalities there in terms of understandings or misunderstandings about Britain uh, and the Holocaust. And finally, I think also, which is notable for me, was the continuities between conceptions. And we couldn't say too much about this in the claims conference survey because they only asked one or two questions in this kind of area. We, we, we went into a bit more depth in 2016, and that relates to responsibility. Um, and uh, I mean, very much the, the kind of narrative we encountered with the students in 2016 was one whereby responsibility uh, was understood through the lens of, crassly put, it was Hitler what done it, or Hitler and the Nazis what done it kind of thing. And um, I think in the, the very small indications you get from the claims conference survey, again, it's this very much uh, centered on, on Hitler uh, and the Nazis being solely responsible. And I suppose this ties up and this connects to the first point about understanding of the spaces of the Holocaust. If you, if you don't understand that this was a continental event that encompassed different countries, different regimes, um, uh, people of different nationalities, then, then you're not going to then be able to think about responsibility in, in a sophisticated way. Um, I think the final thing I'd say about the, the this point about the continuities or, or commonalities that we've that I've just touched on there. I think it's notable and it's striking, and I think this is where we get to the kind of issue about how concerning this is, that we're talking with the 2021 20, claims conference survey, we're talking about a survey which had 40%, um, I think it was, of respondents who were under the age of 40. Now, as my colleague Becky Hale has pointed out in a, in a recent uh, article which she's written, that means that in theory, 40% of those respondents should have um, experienced some form of formal education about the Holocaust during their secondary school education. Um, so in, in some ways they are of the age of the national curriculum, the Holocaust being in a national curriculum. So that we are finding those, uh, that we're finding in the whole survey that there are these 
misconceptions and misunderstandings, um, I think it's worth contemplating how that could potentially be explained, at least partially, by the fact that we've got uh, a, a significant proportion of those respondents um, having recently gone through or, or at some point experienced um, Holocaust education in their secondary education. So this raises fundamentally, what do we take away from it? Well, seemingly there's, there's some ingrained enduring um, misconceptions and misunderstandings among a, among a proportion of, of society who arguably should know more than most about the Holocaust if they've gone through this, this system. Uh, and that they don't uh, seemingly, or that, that there are these enduring myths and misunderstandings, I think relates to and raises the questions of, of our understanding of the historical elementals of this. You know, who, what we're we talking about here, who did what, where, when, how, uh, and that I think is, is absolutely crucial before we then start contemplating questions of, of what do we take from this? What, what does this mean or, or anything like that? Um, so for me, that was, particularly striking that you've got so many commonalities within a survey that has such a significant proportion, uh, 40% of people who in theory have, have learned about the Holocaust, supposedly. Thank you. It's, it's really interesting to you talking about sort of the fundamentals of understanding that underpin uh, public knowledge about the Holocaust, as well as some of these sort of enduring misconceptions. On that note, I wanted to ask you, how would you say things have changed since you wrote some of your some of your biggest work in terms of the the book in nineteen in, sorry in two thousand and fourteen um, on Holocaust consciousness in contemporary Britain? If you were to write that book again now, what do you think you would change in terms of the arguments that you make? Um, no, that's a really uh, really hard question. Good question. Uh, so so well done there. Um, uh, good stuff for you. Um, well, I, I suppose there's there's always things which um, which you would do differently um, if if you were to go back and do it again. I think probably there's two or three things which, in hindsight, I would I would like to have done in greater depth, and and perhaps maybe there's still scope for that. I think one of them is is, um, and I've talked about this before in in, in other other scribbling that I've done. I, I think there needs to be a, I think there needs to be a rigorous and robust detailed historicization of the evolution of Holocaust Memorial Day. Now, by that, I don't mean the creation of the day itself. I don't mean that. Instead, I mean, how has Holocaust Memorial Day developed over the last two decades, um, thematically, uh, organizationally, in uh, the way in which it's set up? I think there's, there's a piece of work that really needs to be done there. And, and I don't think in my defense, I was able to do it because I was kind of in the middle of it, so to speak. Um, but but I think that's that's definitely something which which if I was to go back and do it again today I I, I try and do a bit more on I think there also needs to be um, a, a kind of greater interrogation of what we might call the first post-war period so I think this is the broadly speaking we're talking say 1945 to 1975 or something like that I suppose the kind of what I might call the the pre-Holocaust consciousness phase that first generation and really um, kind of trying to think about, well, how, how is this being memorialized? How is it being thought about? How is it being um, marked? How is it being talked about in ways that we won't necessarily recognize as being Holocaust memory or Holocaust consciousness? Um, instead, I think there's, there's something more to be done there about looking through the lens of genocide consciousness and thinking about genocide and representations of genocide in in, in, in post-war Britain and the ways in which Britain um, thought about that, but kind of as a means of perhaps um, getting at or, or, or articulating the experience of, of, of European Jewry. So I think there's, there's more to be done there. Um, and finally, I suppose, I think related to that, I think there's, there's a lot more that could be done about um, post-war British history generally and integrating the development of Holocaust consciousness within that. Again, particularly during that first period in terms of thinking about uh, decolonization, in terms of thinking about um, the, the, the loss of empire. Also, I think something which has come to my mind in, in the last few months is, is thinking about uh, anti-racism and, and the growth of, of post-war uh, racism in kind of a declining imperial Britain. So in the 50s and in the 60s, thinking about how 
racism and anti-racism also uh, was inflected by um, or, or indeed perhaps um, obfuscated what we might recognise as, as engagement with the Holocaust. I think there's more to be done there. Um, I think there's still elements of the, of the book which kind of hold up um, and which um, which still stand. Um, I think, you know, something which I was trying to argue, uh, trying to, I suppose I was trying to conceptualise or put put together a kind of theoretical model of actually what is Holocaust consciousness, uh, and in a very grandiose and probably unsuccessful way, I was I was trying to think about how maybe that is a way of articulating the way in which we use the Holocaust to position ourselves in relation to the past, but the present, and the future. Um, and I think there's I think there's something there with that. Um, I, I don't know if, if if more needs to be done, but um, the extent to which that also, I suppose, rubs against what we see in wider culture. And, and actually, it's all very well for me to sit here and, and pronounce kind of theoretical models about Holocaust consciousness, but really, how does that stack up in, in, in the everyday world and, and everyday experience of people? Um, so I think, you know, there, there's, some, there's, a, there's a tension there, which I don't think ever goes away. And I suppose the other thing I, I, I wanted to do with the book, and I think which also still holds, is, is the power and the potency of... of what I depicted as the cultural hinterland, uh, and actually the the it's in it's in not kind of so much in official memory projects or, or as as important as they are, it's more in like that kind of ephemeral cultural hinterland. That actually, there we find ways in which people are engaging, entering into memory work around the Holocaust, uh, and I think there's a lot more. I think I think that still holds, and I think there's more to be done retrospectively, but also in, in our contemporary moment. Thank you, Andy, for that. It, it, I think you're right. I think there is definitely a lot more to be done in this area, which is um, exciting, I, su I suppose. Very, very nice. um, so we talked about like a response uh, to the survey. Now we've got to discuss like what next. Um, so how are you going to Can you hear me now? Okay, um, so I suppose I want to discuss like what happens next, as in how do we move forward from this. So in the last postgraduate talk, uh, we discussed the new Holocaust galleries uh, with uh, James Bolgin, uh, of the content uh, there, and early this year it was confirmed that the new and arguably academically controversial um, uh, Memorial and Learning Centre at Victoria Gardens will be going ahead. So can these big sort of publicly accessible spaces, and arguably spaces for, for people that have already left education, so if you're talking about this, this 40% sort of, like of people that were in education during the time that it was compulsory, uh, the only way that we got, I suppose, going to reach them now is through these big public uh, things, like IWM, like the... the, the, the Victoria Gardens Rec Centre when it comes into fruition. So do these spaces, do you think, change the playing field in terms of people that are older? Uh, or are they more problematic, perhaps? Well, I, I think I think in spite of everything else that has been happening to our, our culture and our society over the last 15, 20 years, for me, memorials, museums, monuments, they're still critical sites in the construction and the maintenance of, of historical cultures. So, you know, they, they function in different ways to, to, to perform semiotic, um, a semiotic signpost and representational kind of pointers as, as, as to what's important for, for, a, for a collective. Uh, at the same time, they, they, they function as sites of cultural pedagogy and sites of cultural uh, public education. So, I, I mean, for me, yes, they they absolutely do matter. They still matter, um, despite the the technological changes that have taken place. Um, uh, you know, kind of uh, that they they absolutely still have a role to play, and they can um, they can affect change. I mean, I think if you look at the IWM, for instance, if you just look at the um, old exhibition, I mean, that was immensely influential over the, over uh, over the last twenty years. I mean. We're talking millions of visitors from around the world. Um, we're talking about a, a museum which made a massive um, impact in terms of 
school children who visited it, um, people uh, in beyond formal education. So I think that alone is an indication that, that such an institution absolutely can and does have an effect. I, I mean, I think it's a bit it's a bit harder and it's a bit tri more tricky to obviously talk about the prospective um, memorial and learning centres. So I, I think that's probably best parked in, in terms of thinking about this particular issue. But big spaces and big initiatives, I think, do not always work in unison. Um, and I think this was something which I touched on in, in, in Holocaust Consciousness was, was how in some ways what was happening at the Imperial War Museum with their permanent exhibition was something different to what was happening with Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, so memorials and museums can, they work for different audiences. They proffer different narratives and their impact is determined by the individuals who use or engage them. And you might have an individual who engages with one museum but not another or one memorial and not another. So, uh, so it's very difficult to, to say with a certainty that X has Y impact. Um, I think with this in mind, the, the question is less, can they, can they change the playing field? Because potentially they can, but more in what ways can they change the playing field? And I think for me here, the, the new galleries at the, at the museum are, 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 are illustrative. Um, I mean, I've been there twice now. I still don't quite, I still don't feel like I've got a proper grip on it or a proper hold on, on, on the exhibition. Um, I very much uh, need to spend more time there to process what I, what I think of it. But notwithstanding that, um, I still feel that it's very, very clear just from one visit to that gallery um, that um, it's trying to break new ground. Potentially it could um, advance general historical knowledge and understanding in profound and significant ways, which are quite different to how it did in 2020, uh, 20, the year 2000. Um, and, you know, again, without thinking about this properly, but I think there's also a potential to, to, to affect with the, with the new galleries, a, a kind of what I suppose Saul Friedlander called a, a new discourse in, in Holocaust consciousness potentially and Holocaust museology. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to do some really, and there's some very sharp departures in terms of what they're, they're trying to do with the museology, museological approach, but also the, the historical approach as well. But I, I need to think more in, in terms of how effective or, or otherwise, but in answer to your question, can they change the playing field? I think they can, but um, I think we always need to be very, very mindful of the fact that um, you can have the most amazing exhibition or the most profoundly um, potent memorial, but it's the visitor though, to those things who actually determines whether the intention of, of the creator or the creators uh, is realized or, if, or indeed if they, they take something completely different. I mean, um, Michael Bernard Donald's uh, his work on USHMM and their exhibition is, is very clear that, you know, in some ways the, the, the museum was trying to trying to go that direction with its narrative and, and visitors quite often would take a completely different uh, take on things. So um, a long-winded way of saying, yes, they can, um, but um, I don't think we can make broad generalizations. To um, sort of pull together a couple of strands that have come out in the conversation so far, um, we discussed earlier education and schools, and you've spoken about the Holocaust being a key part of the national curriculum and the fact that there is this generation of people who've been within that. Um, but nonetheless, these entrenched misconceptions do continue to exist. Where do you envisage us going forwards from this in terms of education? What can, um, what can be done in school to ameliorate um, Holocaust education and to combat these misconceptions? I know there's a lot of work being done at UCL with the Beacon Schools uh, and there are, there are pockets of good practice around the country, but where do you see this going in the future? Um, that's a tricky question. I, I, I think I think the first thing I would say um, is just to pick up on what you said about the Beacon Schools and, and, and the work that we do at UCL with those institutions. And you know, we've, we've, we've worked now with nearly 200 of these Beacon Schools around the country. And, and frankly, some of the work that they're doing is, is pioneering and it's incredibly inspiring. Um, and it's not just the work that the teachers are doing. I think significantly, what we see with those schools is actually the work that the students are doing. That's really where you, where you, um, where it's where it's quite inspirational. Um, so so there is a lot of positive work that's going on out there. 
and and critically i think there's a growing sense of schools that are working with each other i mean um uh, andy lawrence at hampton uh um school he he's done some brilliant work in genocide education he's brought together a lot of um young people in different schools around the country and, and, and it's amazing so there's some fantastic stuff going on and, and that will continue i think if we speak in more broader terms um as much as we can uh, having the person who's just said to, to be careful of generalizations um if we are going to generalize i think um part, part of the issue is we need to we need to move beyond this sort of one dimensional um uh, reductive way of thinking that the way to solve the problem is simply by having more education. You know, the way to combat anti-Semitism is, for example, more teaching and learning about the Holocaust, or the way to combat myths and misconceptions is is, is more more education. Um, I, I think that's uh, what we've seen, and what these what these surveys, what this what this research illustrates is that that's um, that that doesn't work. Actually, what we need to do is is talk a little more a little bit more honestly about what is it that we're doing and, and why is the ways that we're approaching teaching and learning, why are they not uh, having the desired effect um, in terms of uh, why are these, these myths and misconceptions persistent? Um, I think schools have a critical role to play. They have a massive role to play. Um, teachers themselves though, they're facing significant challenges, external obstacles and challenges, both right now in terms of of COVID and everything, but just more generally in terms of educational changes and, and so on and so forth to this to the system. Um, and I think one of the one of the most important things to bear in mind is is that um, related to that sense of, of, of more education won't fix the problem is that I don't think we should believe that there is a single universal one size fits all model of teaching about the Holocaust which can just be sort of grafted onto any and every school. Um, instead, I think, and this we, we see this through the Beacon Schools, is actually we need to help, we need to enable teachers to teach about the subject in ways which respond to the challenges of the classroom, so ways that are research informed, but which are also, also cognizant of the specific context and circumstances and communities that those schools exist within. So the challenges that one school faces are going to be different to the challenges that another school faces. And therefore, the ways in which those two schools teach about the Holocaust in our conversation, they might have similarities and commonalities on certain things, but, but they shouldn't necessarily be the same because the needs are, the needs are different. Um, I think also the last thing is, you know, we, we can't rely on formal education. Um, we've just talked about museums and memorials. They absolutely have a role to play. But I think also we need to, to have a, and this is very aspirational, but there needs to be a kind of recalibration of, how the Holocaust is framed and, and talked about and approached in politics and culture more generally. Um, I think we need a better understanding of how and what history and memory are. It, it really annoys me when I see politicians or public figures talk about, you know, kind of um, uh, we're, we're seeing the, the end of, of end of memory and we're now entering into just history. I mean, I find that incredibly naive. Uh, 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 and so, so we need to have a a more grown up understanding, I think, as, as a kind of society of what history is, what memory is, how those two link and interrelate. By the same extension, we need to have a, a recognition that education and, and teaching and learning are not the same as remembering, remembrance, commemoration. Um, and I think we need to dispose of kind of empty platitudes which sound very good and which do speak to, to an underlying sentiment which is very well intentioned, but nevertheless kind of serve almost to create a, a kind of wall of sound against which anyone who wants to enter into a conversation in a, in a critical fashion, and by that I mean critique rather than, than just criticising for, for criticism's sake, where you can't have those open and frank conversations. Um, in, instead, because you can't have them because it's almost seen to, to be sacrilege to, to start asking questions about why are we remembering this or how are we teaching about that so um yeah so there's a lot to go there um but for schools but you know it, it's the nature of our conversation tonight isn't it, it this isn't just about teachers or schools it, it, it it's a it's a it's a wider thing than than, than just those institutions thank you um yeah no you're right i think there's a lot to pull out of what can be done in terms of schools, but also, as you say, more generally, you know, culturally. Um, so there's the last question from 
me and the bar, I suppose, <clears throat> pause on what you're what you're saying at the end there. So, especially in Holocaust commemoration and remembrance, we often focus on the moral lessons that can be learned from it. Uh, that the Holocaust can be used to uh, stop racism, stop stop prejudice anti-semitism and learning about that will make you a better person um you see it with most or, or most organizations that commemorate the holocaust perhaps focus on the moral lessons that can be gained from it as opposed to the actual historical event itself um and but if you ignore the moral value of it are you then doing a disservice to the event itself so it's not an easy balance to strike in terms of uh treating it as the historical understanding versus the moral value from it i suppose my question then is um do we have the balance right between these two interpretations or not necessarily that interpretations that's the wrong word two different the, the approaches or are they different um are they different approaches can they work to together uh to kind of put ourselves more forward there's a lot there, Charlie. Um, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but that's all good. Um, well, I, look, I think, I think the first thing I'd say is um, I think it's arguably impossible to divorce and detach historical thinking about the Holocaust from considerations of morality, ethics and philosophy. You know, if, if, we're, if we're trying to enter in or trying to achieve in a very non-realistic way Holocaust consciousness, whatever that is, then that involves inexorably uh, considering moral issues, ethical issues, so on and so forth. I think the second thing I'd say is part of the problem for me with the notion of moral lessons is that I think I think it's actually a kind of a, 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 a way in which it kind of pushes against the idea of well, well that these things just exist that history i mean for me i don't i don't think of history as a repository of of lessons which i can go to and flick through the shelves and and pull one out and then apply it to 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 my daily life or to the future i, I think speaking as a historian um for me two two critical words in history and historiography and the discipline of history are context and contingency and for me context and contingency are concepts which the notion of moral lessons and lessons from history, for me, they kind of seem to, or they conveniently want to overlook context and contingency because, um, because for me, they, they, they want to, they want to immediately, they, they want to kind of obliterate and, and level out that sense of things being historically contingent or contextually dependent. And instead say, well, this is timeless. This, this applies then it applies now, so on and so forth. So, I think those are just some of the reasons why I find moral lessons problematic. And also pedagogically, I find them problematic. I mean, how, how are you going to know in a very empirical way whether your student has learned the lessons of World War One or the Holocaust or the slave trade? How, how are you going to measure that? Because who's going to decide what the lessons are and how are you going to know when they've when they've learned them? So for me, I think history and historical thinking can provide us with insights into humanity, into the human condition, um, and that they can then help us to orientate ourselves within space, within time, and to then think about who we are as, as a species, think about what's been, think about what is now, and think about what may be to come. Now, you might take that as saying, well, he's just arguing the lessons in a different way, I, I would I would say that I'm not. I, I think insights are also dependent on the insights that individuals take, that individuals draw from them. So I think there has to be a sense in which there has to be an ownership here in terms of the learner, in terms of the person who's thinking about this history, um, rather than an imposition of it. And I think um, it, 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 this sense of, of is it about morality or is it about history? It's one that's it's a debate which has, has kind of gone on in school education for uh, school history education for a long, long time. And it's immensely politicized, it's immensely charged. Because as soon as we start talking in these terms, we're talking about identities and the ways in which people construct their identities. 
And if we start turning around and, and saying, well, actually, you're wrong on this or, or that's not quite right, you're, you're disrupting people's worldview and the way in which they think about the world and think about themselves. So I suppose that's a very um, elongated and rambling response to your question. But I think it, it can you have a balance? Um, well, I don't, I, for me, it isn't about it, can you have a balance? Actually, it's more about a question of, of, of we can't separate out um, morality and ethics from thinking about the Holocaust. It's part and parcel of it. Um, I don't think we, I think it's a fallacy to think in terms of lessons of history generally. I think it's more fruitful and, and frankly more constructive for us to think about the insights that it provides us. Uh, and then to think about, well, what are we actually going to do with those insights? Um, and do we want to face the uncomfortable truths and realities that some of those insights can give us? You know, the fact that a lot of our history is about violence and about atrocity, and a lot of those violent and uh, atrocity episodes in history are, are man-made. Um, that's an uncomfortable truth for us to face. Thank you, well, thank you very much for uh, uh, quite, a, quite a somber note to, to end on. Um, we've now got 15 minutes um, for, for questions, so if anyone here has any questions that they'd like to ask, um, please do either raise your digital hand or pop them in the chat um, and we can ask them on your behalf. Um, I believe we have one question in the chat already from, from Phil Barr, um, who says that they're um, a PhD creative writing student working on a project entitled Memory, History, Family, Holocaust, Legacy and Film, a research a screenplay project. Um, there'll also be an educational resource as part of this. Do you think that misconceptions are impacted by A, the media, film and TV mainly, uh, and B, the increase of Holocaust denial on social media? And perhaps if I can add, because I have a feeling you'll answer yes to those, um, how do you think they're sort of those things influence people's misconceptions? Well, I think, um, I, I forget the precise uh, percentage from the claims conference survey that there was a finding in there, wasn't there, about um, the the influence of film and, uh, and and the extent to which people were saying how, you know, they first, or their encounters with the Holocaust were, were through film. And I think particularly they, they were talking about historical documentary. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the history of Holocaust memory in Britain, uh, film has played a critical role at different junctures. Um, by, by film, I mean, I'm using that term to encompass both documentaries and feature films, but, you know, uh, programs like The World at War, um, Spielberg, Schind Schindler's List, Boy in Striped Pajamas, it's almost the case that over the last two, three generations, there have been these kind of key filmic events which have then shaped uh, or had a significant impact at least on, 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 that, uh, on that time and that, that society. So, so I think film does have a, a, a significant um, effect. Um, with that comes a responsibility, I suppose, uh, unavoidably on, on the filmmaker and the filmmakers, uh, whether they're documentary or, 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 or fictional, um, to, to think about the, the consequences or potential consequences that their representations um, can have. Um, are they responsible? I know this isn't quite the question, but are, are they? Can they be held responsible for misconceptions? I don't think that would necessarily be completely fair, um, but um, certainly they 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 can have a significant effect. And I think this highlights the need, and this perhaps links to the the second point that um, our young people generally need a, a, a better. Uh, they need more honed critical faculties whereby they can recognize representations from the past, understand what a representation is, um, be able to then measure that representation against the historical actuality and determine how near or how far it is from that historical truth. Um, and I suppose this, this relates to things like Holocaust denial and so on and so forth on, on social media, because one of the striking things we found from 2016, apart from issues related to knowledge and understanding, was a, um, a, a kind of an inability or, or a reluctance, perhaps both on young people to actually engage um, in and uh, enter into critical um, uh, uh, interrogation of material that they came across. I mean, I know this is a concern amongst um, teachers as well. I mean, you know, kind of we're talking about Holocaust and um, to go on another tangent altogether, but you know, kind of you've got outright examples of Holocaust denial, which in some ways 
you know, they're the ones that you recognize and kind of are able to spot and, and you know, you, you can't mistake them. But in some ways, the more pernicious stuff can potentially be some of the myths and some of the misconceptions, right? Because, you know, you can, you can, we can recognize Holocaust denial. It's a bit trickier to recognize relativism and revisionism if you're not careful and if you don't enter into enter into things with a with a spirit of, of, of criticality and critique. Um, so I've I've kind of I've lost the, the the train of my response to to the to the question. But I think um, yes, film can have an influence. Absolutely. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that film is responsible for misconceptions. But I suppose the other way of, of, of looking at this is, you know, by the same token, film, one would think, can also play a role in, in rectifying potentially some of these misconceptions if, if done so in, 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 a, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, there are two questions in the chat, but I do have a question that was pr uh, pretty submitted to us from Dan Adamson. Uh, who can't make it, but you want me to ask you this in uh, here. So how would you respond to those who might argue that the Holocaust is not really part of British uh, history? And why do you think it, it is important for the public to have a, an awareness of how Britain responded to the Holocaust? Okay, well, um, I think the first bit is, is um, uh, the sense that it's not part of British history. Well, I, I, I suppose my the best answer I can give to that is is um is that a couple of hours ago actually the AJR launched a, a new resource which um which is called the UK Holocaust Map and um it basically is is it looks like an incredibly um insightful tool which basically kind of captures in, in a very um interesting way uh, the, the the extent to which there are um a number of different uh, I suppose sites and memories isn't quite the, the way of putting it, but that there are different connections across the country to the Holocaust, mm -hmm. both both the Holocaust during the 1930s and 40s, if we're thinking about it in that way, um, but also Holocaust memory as well. So, so the sense in which people say that this is not part of British history, well, I think the historical record um, uh, uh, refutes that in terms of uh, the, you know the kind of the fact that um, Britain was at that part at that time it was one of the great powers in the world. Uh, it came that came with it came responsibility. There's issues related to Palestine and Jewish immigration to Palestine, um, responses to the atrocities. So, I I, I don't think that the historical record um, uh, holds holds out to the idea that this has nothing to do with Britain and, and its history. Um, the, the, the notion also that, um, you know, this is uh, what's it got to do with us today, I suppose, is, is also, well, this is history which touches on, on European history. It's, it's not German history. It's not Polish history. It's European history. Uh, whether some people like it or not, we are part of European history, um, uh, both historically part of European history and going forward, we're going to continue to be part of European history. I don't think there is... Um, I think also it's worth thinking, uh, this, is a, 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 this is an issue for the field generally, but there very much needs to be a move towards better integration, I think within popular discourse and popular understanding, a better integration of the Holocaust into the broader phenomena of gen genocide and man-made atrocity. And when you're thinking about how the Holocaust fits within genocide and the history of man-made atrocity, well, that's when you run into um, other historical genocides, issues related to colonialism, imperialism, the history of ideas, things like eugenics, Darwinism, so on and so forth. So there's a plethora of ways, I think, in which this is part of, of British history and it will continue to be. And for those reasons, it will continue to have relevance. Thank you. For the next question, let's go to Phil Gennings from the Holocaust Educational Trust. Um, hi there. Um, yeah, I would absolutely echo the points that um, Andy has sort of uh, made about uh, the impact of film. I work with a lot of school groups as an outreach uh, educator, but I also guide groups around Europe. And um, the number of times, you know, films like um, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas comes up um, is frankly horrifying and doesn't bear thinking about. But uh, the reality is, is that social media and the way in which the Holocaust is depicted on television and, and what have you um, does 
does have an influence. But my question more related to the um, the issue of Britain and the Holocaust, and in the sense that as part of my master's thesis, I researched um, British reactions to the liberation of Belson and the Belson trial more specifically. And I was quite horrified to discover as I did my reading and went through mass observation and newspapers and stuff like that, that actually our whole narrative of the Holocaust and Britain's place in it is severely twisted. And it sort of echoes something that um, Andy made about how we perceive things like First World War and the whole history and memory uh, issue, because um, we have adopted a memory of the Holocaust that emphasizes our role as a good guy when in actual fact it isn't. And given the constraints on time that many teachers have with school curriculum uh, issues and pressures of exams, and the fact that the sort of people who will go to Holocaust museums will be self-selecting. Um, what else more can be done to, um, as Andy suggested, recalibrate our nation's approach to our understanding of Britain's role in the Holocaust? Um. Thanks, Phil. That's a, a, a really meaty question. Which um, sorry, uh, no, no, don't, don't, no, don't apologise at all. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very, it's a very important question. Um, uh, it, it'd probably be uh, the topic of a could well be the topic of a, another an evening evening conversation, couldn't it? I, I suppose, notwithstanding everything I've said already, um, I think one of the ways in which um, we can begin this process, um, in some respects, comes comes you would like to think can, could come from the top. So, you know, when public figures and politicians are, are talking about the Holocaust on Holocaust Memorial Day, for instance, or, or when they're talking about the Holocaust in, in reference to other things, that, that they do so um, with, with candor and with um, a, 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 an open face towards um, the, the, the different dimensions of, of Britain's connections with the Holocaust, good and bad and, and indifferent. Um, obviously, we're we're led to believe from, from the, the, the statements and the pronouncements that this is something which the prospective um, learning centre and memorial at Westminster will be doing. So um, if it does that in a way, uh, in the spirit of what it's promising to do, then perhaps that will go some way to, to doing it. I, I, it it's, we can only speculate, can't we? Mm. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, everything has a role to play here in terms of um, uh, museums, memorials, schools, uh, politicians, so on and so forth. I, I suppose just to go back to the schools thing, uh, quite often we found over, over the years working with, with schools and with teachers is that schools and teachers are very conscious and aware of their local communities and issues in their local communities. And they're also very conscious and aware of differences in levels of knowledge and understanding of the Holocaust between their young people and um, the, the homes and the parents and the carers that they go home to. So there is, I think, something to be done in terms of schools playing a role to reach out into that local community through developing the knowledge and understanding of their young people who hopefully can, can either go home and share that with, 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 with the people that they live with, the families that they live with, or the people uh, who, who they share their, their houses with, and or through schools acting as kind of community hubs in which they can then enter into this process. I realise that that's all very a little bit blue sky thinking, but um, it, it's it's a really really good question, Phil, and um, I think it's one that we all need to ponder. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Phil and uh, Andy. The, the, the perhaps in that, uh, that question, we've got um, a few more in the chat. I say we've got. Um, uh, probably time for like one more question. So I'm going to go for the question from uh, Axel uh, from King's College. Um, just because it's quite a nice way to, um, I say nice, it's a um, way to kind of close us, up, uh, us off. So uh, Axel asks, where do you stand in terms of comparing national socialism more generally and the, and the Holocaust or in a more limited way? 
and thinking about the genocide in, in China at the, at the moment, how can we link this back to our understanding of the, of the Holocaust in itself? And does that have value, I suppose? Well, I, I mean, I think, I think one, of the, one of the big um, advances in the scholarship over the last um, 10 years and a little bit more um, has, has been the extent to which the uh, growth of genocide studies has uh, enabled um, a, a more rounded 360 understanding of, of the Holocaust as, as, as a phenomenon of genocide and how it um, uh, has links and connections to events before and, and events after it. So I think the sphere of comparative genocide, and by comparative genocide, I think we should also emphasize here, we're not talking about comparison in terms of lesser or greater. That's not what comparative study in, in the truest sense is about. Um, I think there's some there's, there's a contribution there that that can make. I suppose in terms of the specifics of, of the Holocaust and, and events in China at the moment, I mean, I, 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 I don't feel that I have enough expertise on, on what's happening in China to be able to, to say with certainty what I do, do or don't think. But I would return to what I said earlier about the extent to which learning about the Holocaust can provide us with insights. Uh, insights into what we're capable of as, as human beings, insights into to what, um, what can occur in certain circumstances and situations. And I suppose we can then take those insights and then uh, uh, contemplate and, and ruminate on how they can or cannot um, shed light um, on, on, on contemporary developments and contemporary events. Um, so, so I appreciate that's not necessarily a perhaps the, the answer Axel was looking for, but um, I, I think, I think there's, there, there, there's a lot of knotty issues there. And um, uh, yeah, I'd sort of return to that point about history uh, being, being something which we think with, and we think with it uh, in, in, in different directions, backwards, forwards, uh, and perhaps we need to think with it uh, internally as well, thinking about in terms of ourselves and who we are. Well, well, thank you so much, Andy, for, for giving up your, the last hour to speak to us today. We've covered an incredibly large amount of ground, um, which I think we can all be really proud of. Um, thanks for everyone for, for coming and having questions. We'll be uh, wrapping up now. Um, just to say, we do have a couple of events planned for January, which we're looking forward to sharing with you all shortly. Uh, so do keep an eye out on the mail lists and on social media. Uh, for all of those and we look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon as we head into Holocaust Memorial Day month uh, in January next uh, year. Uh, I'm sure a lot of what we've discussed today will, will be in people's minds. So thank you again, again Andy, for, for speaking to us um, and everyone else and uh, over to you, Charlie. Thank you very much, Andy. I don't have anything else to add, to add but um, thank you very much for taking your time. Well, thank you. Thank you both very much. And, and thank you, everyone else, for your, your time this evening. Thank you very much. Later. Thank you, Andy. Wendy, cool.